Well, Halloween has passed at the time of this recording, but there are still scare tactics that are being used every single day in the financial world. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Scare tactics are certainly part of the environment in the financial world, but they're not unique to the financial world. We see them in other areas of life as well. All kinds of advertising uses fear and greed. You know, whether they're trying to sell laundry products or shampoo or whatever it is, they either are having you worried about something, that's the fear part, or greedy. Oh, I've got to have that. That's the old saying, fear and greed are the things that motivate people to take action, purchase something, or to change. And those aren't the only two things that motivate people. We can be motivated by faith. We can be motivated by our values. And if we stick to those, we won't be so easily tricked into the scare tactics or the greed tactics that the world uses to sell their products. That's true. And so, you know, fear and greed, they do scare people into taking action. Oftentimes, I guess that would be the fear part that would scare people into taking action or the greed that motivates them into taking action. But both of those bring a sense of urgency. Why, why do you need to make a decision today? Uh, whereas some of those longer term uh, views that you mentioned, uh, decisions based on values, decisions based on faith. Sometimes there's a sense of urgency with those, but usually it's not as critical mm -hmm. or doesn't seem as critical to make those decisions quickly. And so those are the decisions that tend to get pushed to the back burner. And that's why the, the fear and the greed tend to take the driver's seat. So I'm, I'm starting to feel like there's a bit of an elephant in the room that I want to just talk about. So here we are, McPhee Insurance, you know, doing our podcast uh, with Wealth Talks. And um, it turns out that a lot of people don't like to talk about life insurance or getting life insurance because um, it implies that, that you are going to die and you want to protect your loved ones. So that could be a little bit of fear. And people don't like to talk about that, but there is, you could also say there is a concern because it's not just fearing death. You know, death will happen. Everyone's going to die and no one gets out of life without dying. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of preparedness. Planning. Exactly. And so um, while we don't have to be in fear every day of having a fire in our home, we do want to make sure that we've purchased fire extinguishers and that we've discussed a plan for what if there is a fire and that we have smoke detectors, not because we think about it and worry about it every day, but because we know that it's a possibility mm. and we want to plan for that. Absolutely. And, you know, planning is much easier when we know something is going to happen. You know, otherwise it's kind of guesswork about, it becomes more speculative. You know, if we knew that the stock market was going to rise by 3% every year, um, well, we wouldn't have much uh, risk involved in investing in the stock market. And so there are times to take risks, and there are times to plan around what we know is going to happen. Um, you know, it just makes common sense to do that. And so it's so great when we can um, plan around a known risk uh, that, that we are going to die and use life insurance to plan around that, but also then to be able to use that as a financial tool while we're, we're living. And that's what we love about it so much. It goes together. You're not just buying an extra product that can't or won't, might not ever be used but you're, you're dovetailing it together. Well, one of the scare tactics that, uh, that initiated this podcast to begin with is the fact that a lot of people still are advocating that if you want to get ahead financially, you need to cut up your credit cards. And they scare people into thinking that credit cards are this evil thing. It reminds me when everyone was uh, on the campaign to get people to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. Cigarettes cause cancer. Absolutely not. No cigarette ever caused cancer in its entire entity. It is the people that inhale the smoke from the cigarette that cause their cancer to happen. <laughs> you know, cigarettes sitting innocuously on a table someplace would never cause cancer in anybody. 
Well, it kind of goes back, to, it, it makes me think too of the constitutional right to bear arms. And then people say, oh, look at these killings happening. It's the gun's fault. We need to yep. get rid of guns. No, we need to be responsible. Uh, you know, uh, when does them, whenever say, oh, there's car accidents on the road, we need to get rid of cars. No, we need to be careful about what we do. Sometimes there are accidents and, you know, sometimes people use them as a weapon. That's wrong. But that doesn't mean we should get rid of them all. And we can say that about everything. Ice cream doesn't cause obesity. It's the excess eating of ice cream that can cause obesity. It's what we do with certain things and how we manage it. And to say that credit cards are going to keep you in debt and keep you from being a good financial steward is nonsense. If you need to be taught how to use your credit cards wisely, credit cards can actually be a means of getting ahead financially instead of getting into debt mm -hmm. financially. And so that scare tax, take, oh, you better cut up all your credit cards or you're never going to get out of debt, is hogwash. Yeah. And, and it can actually cause loss of, loss of opportunity, potential Huge opportunities. Huge loss of opportunity. Come along. Basically, you know, with, with a credit card, you're getting 30 days to use other people's money without, a, without any interest, and you get to earn the points off of it, and it can help stabilize cash flow. Because Absolutely. then you get a chance to look at the credit card balance and move the money around. You know, it just, just gives you a little bit more flexibility. You do have to be careful not to abuse that flexibility. That's where the fear part, you know, the, com, comes in, and also the greed, because some people, if they have... A balance down the credit card, they are tempted to go and spend it. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there, you, you do have to, if, you, if you're someone that, that, uh, that is vulnerable to that temptation, you have to watch that. Mm -hmm. Oh, know, Michelle, but, but this reminds uh, me. It's a tool. This reminds me. You can use it a, as a tool. This reminds me of a story we used to read our kids about frog and toad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know which one you're referencing. <laughs> and frog was visiting toad, or toad was visiting frog, I can't remember. And do you remember, John? I don't remember and which they one were, it was. They were eating cookies, and they were eating cookies like crazy. And, and they would and, eat another cookie, and then they would eat one last cookie, and then one more cookie. Y you guys know the story. I mean, you, <laughs> you finally probably they decided, have it in your own life. Let's put all these cookies in a box and put them up on a shelf so we can practice self-control. Well, that's not self-control. Well, they end up getting the box back down, and eventually I think they finally take the box out and let the birds eat the cookies. Mm -hmm. And then Toad or Frog, whoever was visiting, said he went home to make a cake. Okay. <laughs> okay, and, it was Toad. And, <laughs> to Toad went home to make the cake. I remember so, that much. And so what's happening here is we find people that cut up their credit cards to get out of debt. We'll get out of debt, and then they have nothing to show for their efforts, except that they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And they go back and they end up being worse off in debt than they ever were prior to that. If we could count on our hands how many times we've done that, we would, uh, you know... How many times you've seen that we've happen? We've seen that. We can't yeah. count how, on our hands and toes how many times we've seen that happen. Well, and Tom, you used to be in private chiropractic practice. And you notice the same sort of thing happen when people were on a diet, especially on a diet where they were just uh, an extreme diet where they were just dropping pounds. They had extreme different eating habits, very restrictive. They lost a lot of weight really fast. But then a few months later, they had gained most of it back, sometimes more than what they had, because they didn't learn to modify their lifestyle. They went on something extreme, binged, and then, like you said, they were like starving for calories, and they never learned the balance needed. This happens in life because it's a biblical principle. Jesus talked about the woman who had demons cast out of her, and they left, and they went somewhere else, and they couldn't uh, find a home. And they came back to the person that they had left, and they found it was all clean and no demons were there. And so they went out and got a bunch more demons that were worse than themselves, and they all came and inhabited her. And that's what happens in our life when we substitute discipline and self-regulation uh, with a scare tactic and just acting out of fear. If we're not, not not acting out of faith and belief, then we end up worse off than we were before. Yeah, and we have to change those habits. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, so, so cre- talking about cutting up credit cards, that's kind of working off of a fear um, tactic there. Um, something that works off of a greed tactic is the the often promoted you know phrase that you've got to take a higher risk in order to expect a higher return. Mm. Mm. <laughs> this reminds me uh, of a phone got, call just the other day that we had. Someone was saying, oh, you know, I just don't know about this life insurance policy. They already have more cash value in it than what they paid for the policy, but they just don't know about it. They're grumbling about it because it's not growing. But I know for a fact that this same fellow invested a lot more money in oil wells that gave him zero return. Mm-hmm. High mm-hmm. risk product. And he has nothing to show for that except the experience of losing money. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and it's interesting because um, I, I know who you're talking about, and this client has had his policy many years, and now he's saying maybe I should have just bought term and invest the difference. Well, we're, we're going to go back and add up what he's paid in premium, and if that would had been a term policy, you know what he would have paid in premium there, and it would just be gone because he hasn't died in that time. Thank mm-hmm. God. Um, but you know he has paid this premium and now it's more valuable than what he's paid for premium. So that's quite a contrast just right there. Mm -hmm. And of course he hasn't looked at the fact that he, if he really had good investments that he knew were going to pan out, he could have borrowed that cash value and had more money than what he paid for the policy to invest with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because good investments, you know, they don't always last a long time. That's correct. And so you, you find an opportunity, what's your money doing the rest of the time? When it's sitting there, is it just sitting around waiting for opportunities and earning next to nothing? In fact, it's actually doing something for you. It's actually doing something for you while it's waiting if you keep your money in participating whole life insurance. In fact, is some of the highest returns that are out there are short-term investments. Mm-hmm. You know, you, if you don't believe us, just go down to one of these payday loan places. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, it, it is often true that if you're seeking a high return, that there is high risk that goes with it. That, that part is true of the phrase, but you shouldn't be tempted to go out and take higher risk just to earn a higher rate of return. Yeah, you got to have that. True. You got to have that in balance, and that's where discernment comes into the picture here too. Because what is a higher return? What is a higher risk? Uh, yes. There's there is some subjectivity w- uh, that's involved whenever you're talking about risk. Some people would be concerned if they lost five hundred dollars. Some people would be concerned if they lost fifty thousand uh, dollars. So there's a difference, um, you know, that as different people look at risk. And we call that, you know, some some people try to evaluate that and call it risk tolerance in the investment world. But really, when you're talking about how much money that somebody can be comfortable losing before they've mm-hmm. got to do something, before they get a sense of urgency uh, based on the fear that they've got to do something about this, that's we, we kind of call that loss tolerance. What is your loss tolerance before you're going to feel like you need to do something about this? You know, that's so important because I remember years ago when I was just in my late teens hearing someone lose a tremendous amount of money in stocks and real estate. And the advice that they were given is to hold on to it Mm. because whatever goes down has to come up. (laughs) And this guy was really puzzled by that because that defies the laws of gravity. Yes. That, that's exactly what <laughs> just popped in my head. Ah, uh, gravity here. <laughs> and so in that case, if they don't understand the fact that what goes down can come up, it doesn't always come up because, you know, look at Enron. It's no longer, mm-hmm. okay? Look at WorldCom. It is no longer. Look at all the solar plants that the Obama administration gave loans to that just collapsed and are no longer. Not everything that goes down comes up. And um, so just buying and holding a piece of stock just because of that philosophy is a high be, risk. It could be dangerous. It's a high risk. It could be dangerous, yeah. You know, there, there is a difference, too, between somebody that is looking to invest productively, um, looking for some way to put their money to work, versus somebody that is approaching the investment world with a gaming mentality. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people approach you know, the investment world more as a game. Where they're they're playing, you know, almost like gambling yes. in a way. The the mentality that comes over into that, and it doesn't serve people well. Oftentimes, it's some of that fear and greed getting involved in the process, and that's what often takes people down. Yeah, and sometimes people are so desperate to begin investing that they just like 
quickly invest in something <laughs> or maybe even t- go they, in debt to invest in something. They don't spend the time to build their foundation first. Right, right. Well, Solomon told us solid. years ago that we're to yeah. cast our bread on the water eight or nine times because it's going to return to us. And so we have to be wise in where we're parking money, where we're storing money. Nelson Nash wrote a book that many people don't know about. He, and many people know about becoming your own banker, the infinite banking concept, because that's what made him famous. But he also wrote a follow-up book, uh, The Warehouse of Wealth. Where do you keep, where do you store your money? And that is, his answer was dividend-paying whole life insurance. And by storing it there, you're guaranteed some growth mm-hmm. every year, year to year to year, but you're not denied the access of your money or denied the growth if you do access your money. John, explain how that works. So when you start a life insurance policy, the premiums that you pay, um, part of it buys a death benefit, but then there's a part of it that also builds equity and grows over time. Because oh, eventually... If, if it's designed to do that, because not all whole life policies do that, it has to be designed for the high cash value. Right, for, for high cash value, right. Uh, all whole life policies will build a cash value. Eventually. Not necessarily in the first years. Right. So that, that's where the high cash value component comes in. That's what we help people to do, you know, design the policies to make sure that you do have those high early cash values. Right. But over time, the cash value in a participating whole life insurance will grow to equal the death benefit at maturity, whether that's age 100 or 121, so depending similar on the to type a mortgage. of product. That you build equity as you pay the mortgage it, down. It will get paid off eventually. And the same You're thing in whole life payment. insurance as you pay premiums, it pays the death benefit off. And that is it correct. becomes equity. That is or correct. Cash value. So um, as you're doing that over time, you know this cash value is going to be growing. And so if you need access to the money along the way, you can take a policy loan. And usually, you know, between years 8 and 15, on most policies that are designed for high early cash value, like you mentioned a second ago, Mom, um, those are going to, as one, once you get to that point, everything that you've paid in premiums is available in cash value. So it's kind of like the policy hasn't cost you anything except the time that you put into getting it started, building the foundation that we were talking about. And then you can access it. You don't have to wait all the way to your age or 15 to access it, but you can access it along the way by taking a policy loan to go take other opportunities that are coming along. And remember, the cash value is still growing. In the background, even when you take the policy loan, you're just paying interest to the insurance company for letting them use, for letting you use their money while your policy continues growing in the background. And because your policy is continuing to grow in the background, that can help offset the interest that you pay when you do take policy loans. And so overall, you're not cutting the compounding curve when you find another opportunity that comes along. Uh, that's that's good to know. And and Nelson Nash in his book Warehouse of Wealth says this: In the early '80s, he was caught owing 23 percent interest on a raw land deal that he had been talked into by real estate investors. Now, he wasn't a prime bank borrower, mm-hmm. and so prime interest rates at that time were 21 and a half percent. But because he wasn't a preferred customer, he got charged <laughs> another 1.5% on top of that. Ouch. And so what he did is he looked to the policies that his brother, who was a state farm agent, years ago had sold him whole life insurance. And he was able to access money, that equity, John, that you talked about. And he was able to borrow money at between 5 and 8% from those policies and he said he immediately went and paid off the bankers at 23% with that loan. And then he was honest with himself and continued to pay himself back to the policies what he had been having to pay those what he called snakes and dragons. Mm-hmm. Oh, this just recently happened with some yeah, clients of ours, I was I was just thinking that. So just in the last few days, uh, we had Ryan from New Jersey. He called. And he said, you know what, I would like to take policy loans. I'm going to uh, pay off some credit card debt. And I said, well, you know, just out of curiosity, what what are they charging you? And they're charging him 17% on that credit card debt. The loan interest from the insurance company is going to charge him 4%. And he's going to take that. He's going to pay off 
those snakes and dragons. And he's going to redirect his payments back towards that policy loan so that he's again filling his warehouse of wealth so that he can, well, he has some ideas of some business opportunities that once he gets that paid back, he can borrow some for for some business opportunities to expand his business that he already runs. And, you know, he just bought those policies a couple of years ago, even while he had debt, realizing that it was going to be an asset for him. And then uh, it was same day, later in the day, Jason from Nevada called, and he also just bought a policy a couple of years ago. And his original intent was to just let the money accumulate for like seven years before he accessed it. But, you know, the financial times have changed a little bit. And he also has policy loan debt. And I asked him, well, you know, I I told him about Ryan. I said, hey, Ryan just called and he's paying 17%. And he said, oh, that's low. I'm paying 26%. Wow. And um, Jason, he's borrowing the money at 5% with the policy he has. But, you know, he's not really... It beats 26%. Oh, yeah. And even though he originally planned to wait, you know, for a number of years, I think it was like seven he was going to wait, he's decided, you know what? I could cut off some of this bleeding at 26% pay 20%, 21% less, pay it back to himself, he'll be better off financially. And when he gets to that seven-year mark, he might be able to do what he was originally going to do. He might do something a little different, but not paying 21% out of pocket, I mean, he'll have that back. And so, you know, he just adjusted what he was going to do using the same product that he, again, bought just a couple years ago. Even though he was in debt, he bought this asset. And, and in reality, he's going to save more than twenty-one percent because the twenty, you know, whatever percent it was, is compounding oh, on sure. itself, and so that's going to add up to a lot more than just twenty. Uh, you know, the difference of twenty-one percent there, and, and the he, dividends that's, that's, that's 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 cool. he's earning the policy are going to overcome a lot of that five percent he is paying to the Correct. insurance company. Correct. So it's yeah. you it's know a, it's a win-win. It's a win-win yeah. all the way around. I remember when we first started into. Um, teaching and educating about life insurance, someone from Southern California called me and wanted me to map out what it would look like if he did this for 10 years. Yeah. And I was foolish enough to think I could attempt to do that. But Nelson Nash called this the infinite banking concept because it is infinite. You cannot know when 26% interest is going to hit you. Who would have thought five years ago that we were going to be paying eight percent for people to buy a car or to get a house payment? Yeah, mm-hmm. those things or, happen cyclically in the history of the financial world, but we don't ever know when it's going to happen. We just had a client from from Illinois call us, Steve, today, or he emailed me. He said, "Hey, Tom, is there a way we can adjust the premium on my wife's policy? Because, hey, this building I'm financing, the interest rate just went on went up." Oh, way up on it, and I would like to get that loan paid off. And guess what? There is flexibility, Mm -hmm. huge flexibility in the way those premiums are designed to go into a policy, and he's going to be able to pay off his snakes and dragons Mm -hmm. and then come back and get his wife's policy that he was talking about funded the way he wants to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, Jason, this kind of goes with what we talked earlier about credit card debt. He was... uh, you know, really kind of disappointed with himself that he ended up with this credit card debt. But you have to look, um, he got this credit card debt right around 2020. Mm. Um, And his his line of work was greatly affected by the pandemic. He also did a move at that time. So different financial things happened. He needed to use those credit cards to get him through a challenging period. And he's getting excited that he'll be able to pay those off. And he said, and then, Michelle, I'm just going to use them as a financial tool. Well, yeah, because now he'll have the asset of the policy also working as a better financial tool for him. So it puts him in a better position to meet the challenges, the financial challenges that come up in life that we can't really plan for. But our pre-planning around our death, that pre-planning allows us to plan better. It does. You know, you mentioned uh, Solomon earlier about throwing your bread upon the waters, and Solomon also said something else as we kind of return to the summarize the theme of our 
uh, show today about uh, the scare tactics and finances. He said, the wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way, but the foolishness of fools is deceit. And that's really what we're doing here. We're, we're exercising discernment mm-hmm. to look at all of the things that are, you know, the flashy things that are promoted with fear and greed out there today. We're looking at credit cards as a financial tool. They're not all bad, like some people would have you believe. And, you know, the, the wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way, but the foolishness of fools is deceit. Um, John uh, in the Bible, First John uh, 4, verse 1, he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Spirits of fear and greed that are out there. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Jesus per- telling us, warning part. us to be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves goes right along with this. Yes, we need absolutely. to be very, very careful on who we believe. And I think that goes right along with this because deceit is very, very common yeah, in so, the world. So First John here, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, as you're listening to this, you might be thinking, well, what if I don't have you know, the knowledge to, to understand, you know, to make the discernment between these different financial uh, tactics that are out there. And uh, James in the Bible has the answer for us on that. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. It doesn't say it might be given to him. It says it will be given to him. And that should be a great comfort for you. You, you can learn from people, you know, but always be looking to discern the truth. Mm-hmm behind something. Don't just be looking at the surface, the superficial, because that's where you'll find the fear and the greed and all the other tactics uh, that people use to try and get you to make decisions based on a sense of urgency today, short term. Be sure that you're exercising that long-term thinking and looking for the truth. And along with that comes instant gratification. Uh, There really is nothing that um, gives us instant gratification indefinitely. That's it true. is things that we plan and do and accomplish over time that give us that sense of accomplishment and satisfaction that is eternal. And we're not saying that whole life is eternal here, but it's going to last our whole life because it's whole life insurance, not universal life insurance or term insurance. Mm-hmm. And that's why we use that, because we have this guarantee that it will be here and available to us to use and exercise and and nurture our entire life. Yeah. And neither is wisdom. You know, getting wisdom is not necessarily an overnight thing either. Um, Mm, Hebrews talks about that. This is going to be an ongoing journey. Uh, Hebrews says, solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice, Mm, constant practice, Mm -hmm. to distinguish good from evil. So this is an ongoing thing. It's something that you're going to constantly practice using the discernment that God has given you and building upon that, you know, to discern the truth from the fear and the greed that's out there in all facets of life. Well, Michelle, this is bringing us right back to why we wrote a biblical guide to personal finance. Mm -hmm. It is the fundamental basis of where we're at, where our morals are, where our values are. What are we here for in this life? Are we here just to satisfy our selfish desires? Are we really here to be able to do more, and to be good stewards of what God gave us. And to do that, we have to understand what the Bible teaches about money. So the book, A Biblical Guide to Personal Finance, we can get that on the website, wealthtalks.com. That's right. Be sure to get your copy of that. And they make great gifts for the holidays too, by the way, Christmas. They do. Uh, We've had several pastors read through that book. Uh, One of our marketing agents read it. He's going to use it as a study guide in his book. And with his church, it's a great resource to open people's eyes about the truth so that they don't have to run scared through life about their finances. They That's can right. They have the assurance and they can have the confidence to move forward in faith, knowing that God really does want us to be wealthy. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the best books that you've ever written. Um, I told, told you that when I first read the, the draft of it. And um, one of the reasons I was thinking about, you know, why why that is the other day. Oftentimes, when you're talking about financial principles, you know, there's a certain amount of material that may be dated at some point in the future. Oh, sure. You could because things change. You know, just five years ago, we didn't have the interest rates that we do today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, there's different you know strategies, different tactics that will change 
over time. Different ways to practice things. Right. But when you're pulling the truths out of the Bible, those are timeless truths. They're going to apply whether we're using the U.S. dollar 50 years from now or whether we've changed to another currency. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all about it's about financial stewardship, and those principles shine bright and strong through that book. Yeah, I think well, it's going to be a timeless one. That's because it's based on the Bible. Yeah. We're just looking at it together and uh, applying it to our lives. Yeah. That's true. Now, John, are there discounts available for purchasing more than one of those books? At yes, time if, if you're gifts? buying if you're buying ten or more, you can get a discount by calling our office, that's and uh, we Christmas can presents. we can help you with that seven zero two six six zero seven thousand, or you can get individual copies at wealthtalks.com. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Have a wonderful week.